we were sitting in Ustaz Zainul's office, right across the main school building, which also hosts the prayer hall. There was a framed picture on his desk, the Ustaz floating in midair, and a row of spectators in the background watching in awe. Wearing a full Taekwondo uniform, black belt firmly tied around his waist, rear leg chambered, and the front leg straight, firmly cutting through the air. A perfect flying kick. The picture, photographed with high shutter speed and large depth of field, captured his movement and the spectator's reaction perfectly. I looked back at the Wustad after admiring the picture for a while and he gave me a smirk. I teach Taekwondo too and sometimes I train with the police, he said. The school is one of the oldest remaining pondo in Penang. Located on the mainland around 20 minutes from Butterworth and Ustad Zainul is one of its senior teachers. Pondok is an independent, community-based schooling system that dates back to pre-colonial times. Similar to Pesantren and Langar in Indonesia. It has a strong tradition in the northern and eastern states of the peninsula. My colleagues and I were there as a part of a research tour that we were conducting across the country to learn more about the Pondok system and its history. Part of the reason behind the study was because at that time, Pondoks were getting a bad reputation for harbouring extremist views on religion and a few Malaysians from Pondok background had fled to Syria and joined the militant groups there to fight against the Syrian government. Never mind the fact that most Malaysians who joined the militant groups from the Islamic State to Jamaa Islamia or Al-Qaeda were educated in universities studying engineering or chemistry and came from middle to upper class backgrounds. When it came to looking for scapegoats, the Pondok community was an easy target. Uneasy with this simple scapegoating, we decided to visit the Pondoks ourselves to learn more about them, the people and its history. Instead, of finding elements of extremism, what we found was a culture of resilience that has been sustaining these schools despite their informal status and the lack of formal support from any institutions. Cross-border networks, relationships with authorities, both formal and informal, relevance to the community and a strong do-it-yourself spirit are all part of the culture that is very much alive at these pondoks. And nowhere is this more evident than at this particular pondok in Penang. Open in 1930, the pondok follows the al azhar syllabus from Egypt. At the time we visited, it had around 500 students, including a significant number of foreign students from Cambodia, Southern Thailand, Southern Philippines, Indonesia and Vietnam. Even the local students came from all over the country, many from Sabah. Ustaz Zainul himself is a Sabahan. When we asked him, how they brought in the foreign students since it requires a lot of paperwork he said that it was not technically by the book 
instead of applying for student visas before they came, the teachers will bring in the students using visitor's visa and will process or change their status after they enter. Or not at all. We have good relations with the local immigration and the police, he said. We reverse engineer the immigration paperwork. The Pondok in Penang is also part of a network of six other Pondoks in the region, sharing patrons, funds, manpower and expertise. Ustaz Zainal mentioned a patron, a non-Muslim Chinese-Malaysian business tycoon based in Sabah that helps with the upkeep of the schools as well as validating the immigration documents for the foreign students and the undocumented students from Sabah. I asked him whether the school tended to attract more illegal foreigners and undocumented. And he said yes, since they are barred from entering the formal education system. The Pondocks become the only place they can get education and protection. This is part of a long tradition dating back to during the colonial era where people went to the Pondok because they were not allowed to join the colonial schools. We stayed for Ishak prayers. And after that, like any good Malaysian, Ustaz Zainal served a supper of kueh and teh tarik. Some students joined us and we chatted a bit about their daily lives at the Pondok. Some of them were telling us about their plan for Kuruch, a missionary tour that is also part of their tradition, travelling to other parts of the world, mosque hopping, sharing the good word from the Holy Book, another way for them to also build new networks and relationships. It was quite late when we left the Pondok and headed back to the island where we were staying. On the way, one of us, I can't remember who, asked if we were going to take the bridge or the ferry. Our designated driver, a quiet, docile and somewhat timid Penang-eyed named Fakar, said that we were not going to make it on the last ferry to the island. Then, out of a sudden, and out of character, I must say, Fakar stepped on the gas and started to speed through the quiet and empty street of mainland Penang. One of us, again, I can't remember who, asked Fakar, what was happening? No answers came from him. As if taken over by some sort of spirit, he kept on speeding and running over all the red lights until we reached the jetty and... <sighs> barely made it on the last ferry to Georgetown. On the ferry, Fakar parked the car, turned off the engine, and without saying a word, he got out of the car, sat on the nearest bench with the book in his hand, and just casually started reading. It took the rest of us a minute to recover from the sudden high-speed chase and to recover from Fakar's sudden change of character. I then got out of the car and walked to the front side of the ferry. With Georgetown 
in full view. As we inch towards the island, it was difficult not to admire it. Older than the nation's capital, it has been a place of convergence of different characters from all over the world. Traders, colonizers, missionaries, pirates, government officials, freedom fighters. A true cosmopolis indeed. But with new technology, it is becoming more difficult to stay under the radar, to stay anonymous and to be safe from the eyes and clutches of the authorities. People are selected and filtered before they can enter a place. Behaviors are controlled and little by little, the place and its people lose their unique character. Big money does that too. But at least, some form of rebellious, ungovernable and non-conformist tradition and network still survive. And for some reason, it gives me a sort of comfort. And dare I say, inspiration. Mm -hmm.